We're recording. Oh my God. I'm so nervous. I don't remember any of my lines. We rehearsed this. For... <laughs> that, that's, that's my, that's my line. When that's I, get your, yeah. hey, I, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Buddy. That, oh man, it's been too long. I don't know how long it has been. I, I was thinking of this. It's been, I, I think it was when I went to go see you guys playing in Vancouver outside. I think it was a Canada Day thing. That's right, with Took. I just posted some footage about that today. Uh, we're just rehearsing for that very show, that outdoor uh, Surrey, BC show, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was the last time I ran into you and Fitzy, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that was it. And uh, I, I, just, I just love watching all the stuff that you're posting. I love watching everything that you're doing. You guys have always killed it. I just watched um, you guys, somebody posted on Facebook, you guys, doing remote control in Calgary in 2016. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that... yeah, some cool footage. And and then obviously some town pump stuff was right after it. So I watched you guys a little bit. And, uh, you, you guys were so good, man. I love so that good. It was so I love fun. That, I was saying to a friend the other day, I love that we're at the age now where whenever we talk about a venue, I always have to follow it up with like, it's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and even when I was, I think somebody's camera was from the side of you guys playing Town Pump and the crowd there. And then do you remember like when we used to bring in our own stacks? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. You know, yeah. like the yeah. lights, every, yeah. it was, you know, and it's, it's really, it's really sad that that's not around anymore, but we got to be in it and which is great. It's sad, but at the same time, like I live in Vegas. So it's like, if I go to play a show, like if someone says, come down and play tonight, I walk down, there's a back line, there's a PA, none of it's my responsibility, bring a guitar, plug right. in and play. So there right. is beauty to that. Back in the day when you and I were slugging it out in the clubs, it was like driving around with your own PA system, your own light system and your own crew, like, like a sound guy, a light guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, it was a whole thing. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this with you because, you know, we've had so much you and I have gone back and forth on this a hundred times. Let's do this. Let's, since the very first minute I started doing this, I go, I'm going to talk to Al. I'm going to drag right. Al in. And, and then, um, but it was one of those things where I, I had to giggle when I really thought about it because you're a guy that I knew back when we were playing clubs and we were coming up and doing it. And some of the guys dropped out of music because they got a family, they got a job, they got a career, they're going to school. And I love that you, you your, your backup plan was something even more insane than playing music in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like it was kind of like, right. it was, it would be like you saying, well, I'm going to put on a, a costume and fight crime at night. I'd be like, oh, okay, dude, whatever. It was kind of, right, but right, the, right. The fact that, and, and what I'm trying to rewind it all back to is that for those that don't know, uh, speaking to the invisible audience is that Alex and I, Alex's band was from Winnipeg. And I mean, I, I like, I like you always say that we were so welcoming when we finally crossed paths with you, but. Oh man, it was, it was probably one of the coolest things because we were, you know, we were a band rehearsing in the basements and, and rehearsing at the Metro in the back. Like that's where Sabino or, or Silvano will let us rehearse in the back. And that then was the, you, that was the first place we played was Metro in, in, that's right. in Winnipeg. Yeah. And I remember you guys playing and we were, our whole band was just like, what? And then we went to speak to you guys after. And again, you guys were just super cool and everything. And I remember putting Ryan on my shoulders and walking through. I, I forget it was, what set it was. I was just a big fucking dumb ape that just <laughs> loved what you guys were doing and just grabbed Ryan. And I'm like walking through the crowd while he's doing a solo. It was, it was hilarious and it was awesome. But you guys really, just what you were doing, even though the, the genre was a little different, what you guys were doing and how welcoming you were um, and how open you were and just like talking and jamming about it um, really lent us that much more vigor to, to really get on the road and be like you guys. And then our first gigs outside of Winnipeg was in Calgary and you guys were there to welcome us and say, what, have a great show. We just wanted to say, you know, good luck to you guys. That meant the world. That's that shit that you remember for life. And that meant the world to us for sure. Oh, wow. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm glad we fooled you with that fake. Niceness. <laughs> <laughs> no, but honestly, it's Kurt. Like, yeah, Kurt. Well, yeah, yeah. Kurt sort of, it depends what day you get Kurt on. But uh, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where maybe it's a Saskatchewan thing or prairie thing, because we're all prairie folk, you know, which is the Midwest for those in the United States. Um, it just has that sort of, uh, you know, I, I never, ever have had 
that feeling of like super competitiveness and we we faced it as a band like we always had we had tons of people around us going like you know look side eye at us like these fucking those guys in the back that watch you guys play right a hundred percent they got their like pen and pad out like making like their grading i'm like yeah yeah. it's like we're playing in a rock band we're playing music isn't this great that's what we thought so meeting you guys meeting uzi Susie out in winnipeg all those bands that we really ended up being really close to robin black's band the the, uh, ballroom zombies and all that winnipeg was a was a was just a treasure trove of like everybody seemed to be in a band and everybody had if they didn't if they didn't if they weren't in a band they looked like they were in a band you know it's like everybody looked Mm -hmm. bitching and um, but what I think is really interesting is that, you know, so you're doing that. You're in many ways the most visible member of that band because you're you're nine feet tall. I, I don't really, I don't care how tall you are. My, people always say, well, he's only a couple inches taller than you, Todd. I go, I don't care. He may as well be nine feet because on stage you just, you appear like a giant. This just, the energy was just like, whoa, you know, these guys are next level. It's such a great band and really great at what you guys were doing. But um, the fact that you kind of like, you know, one day it was like, so Alex has been, is, is cast in this movie. Like, or, or was it Heads? Is it Heads? Is that what it was called? Heads was, was the, what well, was the first one, right? Very first one. I was so, playing at Georgie's. I was playing at Georgie's and a casting director asked me if I wanted to audition for this thing. But it all started because I was playing at Georgie's. What was this casting director doing at Georgie's? Were they local? Like Winnipeg people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a Winnipeg local casting. So they were uh, casting local talent for this HBO movie called heads and and it was all brand new to me it's like she asked me and i just finished a podcast where you know my my key thing is just saying yes and i'll figure it out after that yeah. and so i just said yes and i walked into the room and you know i didn't know what i was doing but i had a good rapport with with the director and then he cast me and then all of a sudden i was like this this is kind of cool and in that movie the stunt coordinator rick skeen um said I, I got no big guys on my stunt team like you know we and we we really got along on set and so there was this time where you know I would be playing in a bar till 2 a.m and then literally driving across across the city to be on set and be a gopher because I just wanted to learn everything so I went from I again I just spoke about this and it's such a it, it was such an ego fuck a little bit because <laughs> I'm on stage. I've got the bass. My the thing in my hand is amplified. Yeah. Everyone's cheering, and you're just feeling like a god. And then yeah. next second, it's like, hey, get him a coffee. Don't talk to that guy. You're just here to do stunts. And I'm like, okay, okay. It was such a culture shock, wow. but there was something about the industry that I really wanted to learn. And then I had this little little moment of going, you know. And there was a few moments where I was treated disrespectfully on set, set, oh. and you just kind of. Oh yeah, and you just kind of bite your lip and go, okay, okay. And I always imagined myself in that person's position, like it was a lead of a film and doing the exact opposite to people that were around me, make empowering everybody around me. And I always was, I always had this little thing of going, I'm gonna be in that position and I'm not gonna make anybody feel the way he just made me feel. Absolutely. So that's, that's kind of how it grew into, I kind of got off topic there. No, but that can be like the car dealership or at the office yeah. or in a band or whatever. You can deal with people who are like, fuck this guy, you know? And when, I, when I'm when i in this position, I hope I never make anybody feel the way this person's making exactly. people feel. Exactly. And, I, exactly. and I know your energy to be like, you know, back then, now, it's sort of like, you've always had this, like, as soon as we're together, it's going to be a laugh. It's going to be feeling good, having a great time. But what is that transition like? So in your mind, do you abandon the music thing or does the music thing kind of just fade out? I'm, I, I don't know how that works because as a guy like me who, you know, I, I kind of came face to face with similar things, but I just never fell in love with the onset thing, the acting. Like I did a little mm-hmm. bit of that, but it never, yeah, you gra- did. it never grabbed me the way, um, you know, where like I see it. Cause it has to be a passion. It has to be like, you can't just, like, I thought like, cast the black haired guy with tattoos to be a black haired guy with tattoos you know as I was going, right. well I could do that right. but I don't want right. to do any I don't want to be anything beyond like I don't want to actually make the effort or I didn't feel like it uh, like at the time I was ready to make that kind of like okay let's dig into this let's let's do it and mm-hmm. I saw you I saw you like just like transition out of that into being an actor like and being like I'm going to do this I'm going to pursue this you know what I mean and that's why I say, when yeah, it's like, you, you weren't going into accounting. You were going into another, right? You know, completely different thing. Yeah. Right. But let, let's be honest, though. I was never a 
great bass player. I was a great entertainer. I really, and you know, uh, my band knew my strengths and Tony was, was the guy that was always showing me bass lines. And, 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 and you know, I, I really, I love being a part of a team. And I think that sure. was the biggest part of it. Mm -hmm. Being a part of the team and entertaining, making people watch the stage. And I was more concerned about people watching the band than I was hitting a certain bass lick. It was it, it, so. So when I when I when the when I felt like the band was falling apart, and 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 then I started I hit some a few cover bands just to make money, and and then the acting thing started happening. It wasn't that I didn't love music anymore. It it was being you know, and I didn't realize at the time how similar it was, but it was being. Um, being a part of something that if one person or two people didn't want to be a part of it anymore, then I had nothing. Cause I didn't, I, I was never in a position where I felt um, I can venture on my own as a bass player and start a band and write songs. I was never that type of, I was more of a team player. And, and sure. I felt like, I, I felt like I was floating at at any time the carpet could be ripped from under me. Um, and, and then when acting started coming, it was something that made me go, okay, I can put all my, all my effort into this and it's just me and nobody else, nobody else is on the stage right now. It's just about me. So I can dictate where my life goes, you know, and then, you know, year, years later, you find out there's like a whole team deciding if you're the guy or not the guy. Right. But I loved that journey. I loved winning roles. I loved, you know, there was times where I got called into uh, an audition where the casting director just didn't want me want to see me because there was no way that I was right for that role. Sure. And I kept on pushing. And then when you change somebody's mind of what they think the role is, all of that stuff was just great. And, you know, like that was, that to me was, it was a hard stop just because the band broke up in a way where I was, uh, it, 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 it was, it hurt, you know, when, yeah, when you, oh, yeah. when you love something so much, it hurts that much more when it doesn't when it doesn't work out and and I, i'm not i'm not afraid of loving something hard you know and um so i needed to literally when i started it especially when i moved to vancouver uh it, just before that there was a hard stop for me where it's like i am not going to be playing but then hooking up with scully rest in peace yeah. one of our best boys the best. um who took who took me into his apartment because we were writing a script together yeah. on via internet yeah. And so he took me into his place. I slept on the floor. Him and his roommate lived there. And I, I, my rent was cleaning up after them. And Nero, remember Nero? His yeah, dog? of course. Yeah, yeah. Big old so, German Shepherd meets wolf, uh, whatever. It's yeah. like Wookiee, perhaps. We're not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I would, I would literally, um, I would literally just clean up after these couple slobs. And it was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but he gave me a way to like give back and I had yeah. no problem doing that because I had no fucking money. No. And so, and so then we started a, a band together. We started creating uh, music and, <clears throat> and um, movies and TV shows together. And it was just a, a great time of showing Scully really showed me that I can be creative on my own. I don't need the team. Absolutely. So that, so that really helped the transition going from stunts and, and act from stunts into acting because I really wanted to tell stories. The way Scully and I were writing stuff, it, it lit a flame of, of just, I, I want to tell stories so I can't really get uh, caught in the, in the um, stunt world because I have so much respect for every stunt person oh, out there. It absolutely. was, ju I just wanted to tell stories more than, more than put my body through a bunch of physical pain yeah i love stunt fight i love stunt fighting uh i just don't want to fall off a of shit you know what i mean no would you think your career would as a stunt guy would you be able to still be doing it now or would that uh, be not like not not like this and usually in the industry you know when you're doing stunts it's very rare when you're doing stunts and then you transition into acting and then you're trying to do it as acting and then the stunt coordinator comes hey look we got this job that's four months long you're gonna be paid a shitload of money it's hard to say no to that. I, yeah. And I, and I had, I, I was confronted with those opportunities that I, that I have to turn down the money so I can get the experience. Sure. And that, that kind of helped me through it. But it was, at first it was a hard stop on the music. And then the music was just 
to be creative with Scully. Like I think sure. if Scully, if Scully wasn't there, I probably wouldn't have done it. And you right. know how hard, cause I was in Vancouver. You know how hard it was to walk by something like the Roxy and, and not have this drive to like, I see, I, I was walking, like I have to walk through the Roxy, right? Walk by it on Granville from my acting school in Gastown. So oh, wow. I would be, I would be an acting school in Gastown with kids that are 20 years younger than me. And I'm trying to do what they're doing. Right. And I'm, leave, I'm leaving acting class, walking down the street and then seeing this packed bar, everyone going crazy for the bar band. Yeah. And there was something about going, that's so much easier for me. I could, I could just do that, you know, but there was no future in it for me. So really kind of, going, I, I'm not going to do that. That is all fun and I get it and I've experienced it. This is the thing that I, I think it's gonna carry me through. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the journey of that and the, the, the peaks and valleys and the choices that I had to make for sure. Well, it certainly makes for an interesting conversation if you had just thought like when that initial Heads movie came up to you, it Georgie's when you're playing and someone walks up and would you like to read for this thing? If you had just been like, I'm busy, my, my girlfriend's working or what, whatever, you know, my God, I got to go walk the dog, whatever, or it just didn't appeal to you. Like, what is this? No, I'm a musician. You know, if you had said no to that, how different your life would be and how, and it, it's like these things come along. And I've always said to my friends, and I try to even, even anybody who's listening is it's always better, like you said, to say yes, and then figure out how you're going to do it. Even if you fall flat on your face, at least you did that you know, and you come out the other side going like, maybe that's not for me. And I think I kind of had that experience. I think that for me, the music bug was always there. And I think that it's also based mm -hmm. on opportunity because if something is still presenting itself as an opportunity and you enjoy doing it, then you just go follow it. If you had been in the position where the acting had presented itself, but you had some, you know, your, your musical career was something you couldn't just walk away from. Uh, you're just happening with that perfect crossroads where you just kind of went like, I'm going to chase this down. And the fact that your passion is so inspiring about it, that you, it lit a fire in you that you didn't even know was there. Yeah, no, that's totally yeah. true. And, and we, I mean, we were still, uh, I was still playing with Specula Black, who's on Spotify right now, if you want. Absolutely, to go to Spotify, <laughs> Specula Black, yeah. And, uh, and we, and I remember doing the audition, and then I didn't really do anything right after that. It was that, mm -hmm. and really taking it in and going, okay, this, this is something really interesting. And then I just started, whenever we had, you know, there was times where we were just weren't playing, or we would play like Thursday to Saturday. So I would take like acting classes in Winnipeg and just just feel it out and you know big strong dude who's who's on who's on the stage and all of a sudden is being asked to like bark like a dog and I'm like well, is this really fucking for me right now but <laughs> but watching everybody else do it and just say fuck it we're just fucking doing this yeah. was that was something that was really invigorating in trying something new and and then I just didn't I didn't try to do anything for years after that and then connecting with scully again after he uh moved to vancouver and i started doing more stunt stuff that's when it kind of started really moving so for for me like you said like that yes that 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 tone of yes um will will spark ideas even if it's not in the specific thing that you do you learn from it you you rise for it um there's so many things you can do in those moments the worst thing is to say no because you think you're gonna look dumb or, or or there's a fear involved, you know? Fear is the big one. And I think that, you know, you know, I've had to say, you know, I, I have a harder time now saying no. And I think that becomes kind of part of the artist mind or just working in an, in an industry that's just so, I don't know what next year is gonna look like. I clearly didn't know what last year was gonna look like either, but right. you, you know, it's right. one of those things where it's like, I have friends that sort of, and I try to find the balance between saying yes and having a thousand things just pile on top of you and but then saying no and i generally will not right. say no out of fear anymore because i think it's good to sometimes say yes to things that that are actually scary like i, I don't want to bark like a dog in front of other people but i think that's right. part of the practice is to be able to do that and, and not be self-conscious about doing crazy shit like that i feel like if it if somebody asks me something and it scares me then i'm saying yes like if i feel that I got, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at, usually if it doesn't scare me, it's something that I'm really not like going to be crazy about, but I get a lot of people asking me to do indies and short films and, and not thinking I would do it because of where I am in my career right now. But those are the moments where it's like, somebody's coming to me to do a short film of a role that I've never done before. Sure. And, and it's like, Ooh, I don't, but when you get there, not only am I, 
you know, they think I'm doing them a favor. They're doing me the favor. And on top of that, I'm, I'm learning more about producing and about casting because now I'm really involved in the project. Like the project, I, there's a projects that I've been on where the machine is so big, you just go in and do your, do your bit and you get out. But when you get indies where you're collaborating, you get to learn so much more of the business. And, and I was fortunate, fortunate uh, having that with Van Helsing and Snowpiercer where, you know, Van Helsing was been five years. So every, you know, we're, we're involved with a lot more because we're such a tight unit and it's been five years. So the scary, like when I hear something that scares me, I just, I got to jump on it and figure it out from there. It's good to know because I've got a, a four hour pitch here for you now. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> no, but so what is the process like? So Van, was there a choice? Like was Vancouver just kind of like, well, I'm going to go there because I know we were out there. Scully's out right. there. You know, you had friends out there. Was was Toronto even an option? Was Los Angeles considered? I mean, like was just, Vancouver just seemed like the easiest road to go. Well, that's interesting because Toronto was very like the only the only thing that drove me wanting to go to Toronto was Big D. Derek Horn. Sure. Yeah. Derek Horn are and be, directed remote control, ugly, a bunch of age and right. a bunch of other music videos went on to be. That's director, right. Yeah. One of one of the best dudes ever. And, mm -hmm. and that he was kind of getting me over there, but Scully I was writing with and, and I lived with in, in Winnipeg too. Yeah. And remember the house? Like, Oh yeah. That was I a house, part, yeah. good party house. Uh, yeah, exactly. and, um, but I was literally on my way from Winnipeg to Los Angeles and I was going to stop in, in Vancouver for a bit and you know, try to get to uh, maybe a year in Vancouver and then go to Los Angeles. What was it? But during, I, it, 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 that's that's the spot, right? Oh, like I see, my buddy, I see. Yeah. I, I've had I, I've worked with a bunch of people that live in LA, I see. and okay. I just thought I yeah, I just thought you know what, here's the place to be. Of course, yeah. So and then nine eleven happened. Right. How many so stories? When 9 how many stories do you hear in your life? And then nine eleven happened. We have so right. many stories like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, 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 now it's going to be for the new generation is to go. And then COVID happened. Yeah, exactly. Hundred right? percent. Yeah. But but we uh, but yeah, I was on my way there, and then nine eleven happened, and it was harder for me to get a visa, so I just kind of stayed in Vancouver, and I was I I love that I did because. I don't think I would be working as much as I did if I was in, a, in Los Angeles, because the opportunities are such a huge pool there. Of course. And in Vancouver, you know, Hollywood North, which they call Vancouver, I, yeah. I just had a lot more opportunities and grew my resume and kept on going to class and just kind of like, it, it, it was just non, nonstop because they, they're hiring local talent. So I was a part of the local community. So you get a lot of opportunities for little, little roles here and there that they don't cast in Los Angeles. And then it, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and what a moment to get to Vancouver because things really started blowing up. I mean, they were already mm -hmm. on fire, but things really took off. You know what I mean? Yeah. For but those I'll, that don't know, I'll, it's like, you know, as far back as like 21 Jump Street in the eighties, I guess. And then right, like, yeah. it just sort of slowly- X -Files. Really, yeah, Battlestar Galactica and now all the That's CW right. shows and all that stuff is just yeah. on fire out there, yeah. And it was interesting because for me, again, I started late, man. Like, you know, and I was, and I, I dabbled, like I've had, you know, I boxed all my life, but I didn't really compete until, mm -hmm. you know, in my, in my late twenties, which is very old for, yeah. for a boxer. But I, 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 my, my whole reason of competing had to do with a personal relationship to my dad to bring us closer because he was my coach. And, mm -hmm. and when you're a teenager, it doesn't work because it's you butt heads. Yeah. Of so course, yeah. for me, that was like another career that I had when I was uh, fighting um, in the amateurs all over Canada and while playing in music and then, and then acting. So uh, coming from two different type of careers and then, sitting on the acting thing and just kind of, of, of wanting to grow a certain way and seeing where my journey would go. Cause I, I mean, I don't know if I, I was just fortunate enough to have great people around me that supported me in a way where it held me up to go, like, we're giving you a path to succeed. Absolutely. You know, like these weird little things that would happen around me that just kept me going. And again, like I started late. I, I, and there was kids 20 years younger than me that were booking uh, and I'm just starting. Like when, when Vancouver was blowing up, I was terrible, man. I was just shit in the bed in auditions. There was a, it's a cool little story. It was like, I was shit in bed in the auditions and I would leave auditions going, 
what the fuck, man? Like, why am I shit in the bed? <laughs> it's like when I when I walk into a bar that I know I'm gonna play at, I own the fucking bar. People at tables don't even know that I'm gonna be on stage in about 10 minutes, but I'll walk by, talk, make eye contact, be very cordial, have, have buy, buy a picture for a table. Oh, some big dude just bought us a, holy shit, there he is. You know, like that, <laughs> I, 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 I owned the place, even though people didn't know that I was about to play. And I was like, oh my God, that's how I gotta walk into the audition. I've already experienced it. I already know what that feels like. Right. So now I, I, I just got to walk in the audition with like, I, I'm about to give, I always, I always thought that playing in a band and people that see, seeing the band, it was a gift exchange. It was, Absolutely. you, you, you give me the gift of coming here and I'm giving you the gift of the, of the band. Entertainment. So exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I started as opposed to going to the audition, looking for a job, I was going to give my gift and right get get it back from them and then i can just walk off so that really changed the trajectory of my career when i had to change i had to figure out why i wasn't as potent as i was when i was playing and when i amal amalgamated that it really helped that's so interesting because i was just listening to brian cranston talk about the same kind of idea of you know just the walking into the room like that kind of like that ability regardless of the audition the walking in with that sort of sense of like i don't even need this job like you kind of have right. to have this energy like this confidence this sort of thing when you go in there and it's like i need this money you know or whatever it is smell it they smell it and it and it just sort of permeates within whatever you're doing and some of it has to be kind of like and acting is so specific because when you come into the room and you have a take on the character that may not be the take they have um it's sort of like, well, you kind of have to, you kind of got to go in with both feet and go, this is the way I'm doing it. And you hope that maybe that you're doing it so convincingly that you sway the way they see it, or that's not the way they see it. And, and you just don't work for them. And that's, and that's completely fine. And then you have to be able to walk away and go like, okay. Yeah, definitely. But what's in what I, I, I think the hardest part of acting is the audition. Sure. and is navigating through the audition. Once you sure. get the job, it's like, you know, you get that, like I've been offered roles that I haven't auditioned for the film, but I've been offered a movie. And that's even scarier sometimes because I know when I go into a, I go into an audition and audition for it, they go, oh shit, that's a guy. And I go, okay, I, 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 what I did is what I'm gonna take on set. But now right. I'm getting offered a role and I'm doing all the work. And then first day on set, they're like, uh, what was that? And you're like, uh. Oh, so no. the best part of the work for me is you you go in with your map you've created your map of your storyline backstory for an audition that you get the day before so you have to do so much work to it and then you get in and you commit to to the way you think the role is because for auditions you're your own director you're your own way of working and now what makes an actor succeed is understanding that the director is there to direct you so receiving direction the way that the director would want it, regardless if it if it's completely different, it has to, you can't be so married to what you're doing that you can't take direction that'll go in a completely other way. So Absolutely. that's that's the openness. Cause I again I, I fell in that trap too. It's like I know exactly I'm and then he asks me, you know, to do it not so uh, do it a certain way. And I don't know how to do that. And in my brain, I'm thinking, I just did it differently than what I just auditioned. But what he's seeing is exactly the same audition. Right. So right. you have to be open enough to go, uh, let that information in, take a second, and then do it as the director would want it. And then it's up to you if you want to do the job or not. It was like, I don't want to do a character like that. I thought this character was this. This is, you're asking me to do this now. Oh, I got the job. I, I'm going to pass because I don't want to do that. That that's where the control comes in. Interesting. So, yeah, it's really it's really uh, the, the idea of uh, receiving with an open heart direction from somebody, even if you don't agree with it, you just want to work with it. You know, that's the whole point of it. Absolutely. I think that the like you say, the audition process. I mean, it's the same as anything. If you're you know auditioning for music or auditioning for acting, it, it can be a soulless, thankless thing. And I think that the rejection aspect of, especially in in acting, because 
And I think that in acting and in stand-up comedy, when you don't have a band to fall back on, like I can go up on right. stage with five other guys and fail. And it's like, ah, we, we, we didn't do, or the audience didn't like us. That's fine. But when it's, you walk into an audition by yourself, you walk out of that audition by yourself, you go home with yourself and spend the evening with yourself thinking about, it's, it's such a, uh, it really does, you know, really test everything about you. And I think makes you probably the best you you can be or tears you to, tread, to shreds, I'm sure, yeah. It's a very fine line, man. That's a very fine line. And I think, you know, a great uh, support, like friends around a great, um, and I, 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 I just, I'm a big believer in, in, in talking things out and, and having people that have the same mindset and sharing your fears and your goals. Like, oh, I'm a huge fan of that. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons why I feel like I've become successful in this industry and very thankful and grateful that I am. Cause as you know, it's really tough to be in, you know, to make a living at what your passion is. And a friend of mine told me this, um, my, my buddy Carlos gave me this beautiful little quote and I still, not, I mean, it's so good that I don't think he actually made it up. I think he got it from somewhere, but it's, uh, it's uh, pa uh, patience is passion. Sure. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, like I had, I, there was a guy that came onto a film and he was like, oh my God, like we're shooting the scene for six hours. Like, come on. And I'm like, yo man, this is the way it is. This is how you make Absolutely. the end product. This is just it. And he's bouncing around. It's just, it just wasn't what he wanted to do. And you, you can have that with music because you gotta, you know, we slugged it out in the bars and and trying to move forward in, in something that we love to do. You had the patience to stick with it and move forward because it's what you love to do. And now you you are where you're at. And I think patience is passion. And if you can find your passion, you'll, you'll give it the time. And I think it's, you know, it's also kind of like when you find the path and you just, and you enjoy the path, you enjoy the journey. Like I said, if right. you walk out of an audition and you're like, uh, I failed. Screw this. I'm going to school. The end. You know what I mean? Right. But right. Uh, to come out of the audition and go, what did I do wrong? And really kind of try and figure that out and then turn that into how you're going to do this. Clearly that made you who you are today. You know I mean? I think that it's, it's one thing. And I always say how different life would be if at 23, someone just hands you the keys to the kingdom. Here's your gazillion right. dollar check and your whatever car you ever dreamt of multiple cars. Life changes, right. you know, it's like, and I'm glad, and I, well, I, I don't know about you, but I could say for myself, I'm glad that I've had, I've had to take it on the chin many times and been like, okay, you just get back up. As you know, Muhammad Ali and those guys always said, it's not about, you know, that it's, it's about how many times you're going to get up every time you get. Yeah. Down. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's exactly it. Cause you know, handing a 23 year old, the keys to the kingdom has no life experience. He has no gratification or, or gratitude for what he has for us to work the way we work and then have something that we never thought we would have doing this thing, it, it, you, you just share it. So you share it in such an open heart. And for me, like even when I was going to, like with you guys and going to, to, to acting school with kids that are 20 years younger than me and they're booking roles, I never had a jealousy of, I never right. felt like I was like, oh, God, that should be me. I always was like, it's tangible. You're right there. I can, I grab your arm. You're the guy that I'm in class with working on these scenes and you just booked a huge movie. It's tangible for me. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the ether. And Absolutely. that's how I, that's how I always looked at it. I love my friends booking work. I love my friends booking a job that I audition for because yeah. if it's not me, I'd rather have it my, my, my buddy. And then we can share in that because my path wasn't meant for that. I'm going somewhere else. So it's really, it, it's, yeah, it's the passion, man. It's the passion. That's a very healthy and mature way to look at it because a lot of people do not look at things like that. And you know that as well as I do. There are a lot of people who are yeah. pretty, pretty toxic about that kind of stuff. And we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to kind of cut you off of the knees. But that said, right. so so what is the initial things that really sort of make you feel like, okay, now I am on the right path? I mean, I'm not talking just about heads because it's, I keep saying, like when I was thinking about this, it was, it was like watching things and going, that's that's my buddy Alex. And he's he's standing there with Ed Asner. You know, like you're just going to, it's like that thing, and, and I've had to deal with it so many times with yourself, with Ryan Robbins and, and my friends, but I'm watching right. something, and sometimes I don't even know you're going to be in it, and I'll be like, damn, dude, there's Alex. And my, <laughs> wife's like, my wife's like, oh, wow. You know, it's like, it's that, that, that feeling of just excitement, and I'm the same way. It's like, wow, watching my friends do awesome shit makes me super stoked. But what is the yeah. one, like, when you started, like, those kids are getting gigs, you're still in, in class. When does it start kind of feeling like, hey, I, I'm getting some traction? What's the gig that kind of 
presents itself? Is it TV shows? Is it is it movies? What's what's going on? It's so interesting. I was, I, you know, everyone everyone's typecast in a way, and you know, it that's just what it is. Like, yeah, well, I you're, I, to, yeah. To backtrack, I would imagine your height and your size sort of creates a lot of opportunities, but probably kills a lot of opportunities when they're like, well, it's a romantic comedy and she's five, two, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, right. it kind of goes, he's nine feet. You know, it's like, it right. just sort of creates other opportunities, but go ahead. No, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. And so once, once you understand that there's a, you, you're in a hit zone and you know what your hit zone is for me, you know, when I first started, it was like bouncer number two and security guard. And, and I, and I got that. And I always knew, I was like, that just gets my foot in the door. Like I get that. And I'm going to try to do this a little differently than so-and-so would do it. But it, there was, but I was doing these bit roles that were specifically for my size. And there was two things that happened in my career where um, I went to study with an acting coach named Larry Moss in Los Angeles with, uh, with uh, an amazing actor and acting teacher in Vancouver, Ben Ratner. And we did Of Mice and Men and I played uh -huh. Lenny. Okay. And so for me to play Lenny was let, letting go of the thing that was getting me work, which was the strength and putting it on. Sure. And now I have to be extremely vulnerable and, and create a character. And so we did that and we got some, you know, great, great people were um, really helping us through that. And it really opened up a different level of acting for me. And then I went back to Vancouver and then the role came up that was in the same vein as Lenny. And it was for a film called Personal Effects written by David Hollander. And it was with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, Ashton Kutcher, Kathy Bates. It was a great cast. It was a beautiful yeah. independent film he wrote. And I played a guy that was mentally challenged that was accused of killing Ashton Kutcher's sister in the movie. And and why I, would you why'd you do that? Why'd you kill Ashton Kutcher's sister? Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> accused. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Accused. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and so like so there's this, you know, big um, mentally challenged dude that that did something very terrible, possibly. Allegedly. And allegedly. <laughs> and the, the 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 audition was extremely vulnerable, like, extremely vulnerable. And I just felt like, oh my God, I need to get in the room for this because I just finished working on a character like that. And so I changed the character that I did with Lenny and just gave this character a little bit more of a conscience and a different gait and walking a different way, but, but used all the emotionality that I worked in for the thing. And uh, so the casting wouldn't see me. They were just, all, all the director wanted was like the top level guys that are in the city and the casting wouldn't see me. So they went through one round. Then they went through another round, it couldn't find it. I'm still trying to get my agent to get me in. So sure enough, the last, it was a Friday. I'll never forget, it was a Friday at seven. I was the last guy going in and everybody else was leaving to go to Los Angeles because they couldn't find the dude. And so they'll probably find him in Los Angeles. And I was the last guy to go in and I, I worked on this role and I, I was just so immersed in it and scared because I'm about to do something super emotional and and vulnerable and the worst thing that I could hear was was like three quarters of the way through them going thanks for coming in you know <laughs> ouch yeah <laughs> and then you're like oh uh thanks and, and then you're gone <laughs> oh, right but what was and I was prepared for it but I needed to get that character I needed to just be in a room and do that and then the director goes after after we did he goes okay Okay, great. Um, let's put up a chair. So he pulls up a chair. Right when he started to work with me in the scene with the casting director is when I started to get even more emotional because I felt like he saw me. He I... didn't see a big dude. He saw a, a, somebody that could do the work. And so he really walked me through a setting up and again, gave me the direction to set up this audition a little differently than what I just did. And he really wanted me still and to connect with the casting director, even though the scene is outside and it's kind of big stuff, but he just wanted to bring it in, brought the camera in closer. All these little moves made me go, oh my God, he sees me, he sees me. Wow. So when I started doing um, 
the second take the way he would wanted it. He wanted it. And when the emotion came during the, the and it was, it was, you know, a tortured emotion um, crying that this character was doing. And I, 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 the snot's rolling down my face, tears are all over my eyes and I'm saying these lines, but my internal fuel was happiness because he saw me. Wow. So what, so in his eyes, he's, he thought I was going through this horrible thing, but it was literally me like crying with joy of going, he sees me. I, even if I don't get the gig, this, this, this was it. Yeah, and absolutely. so that it was so great. And when I walked out of that audition, the casting director came in and just congratulated me on doing some great work. And and then two days later, I get the gig, and that that made me feel like there is a future for me in this. And then I had the opportunity. Um, I, that was one great role, but I was still pigeonholed in what I was doing, and I felt sure. like I need I need more and. So I agreed to do a play called Danny in the Deep Blue Sea by, by Patrick Shanley, John Patrick Shanley. And um, it's a beautiful play and, and, and vicious at the same time. And it's a two-hander. So it's literally two people for 90 minutes having this wow. intense, intense relationship. And it's been done all over, all over the world by Shanley. But it's a two. And, and for it being my very first play, I was shit in my pants. I bet. That's a whole other animal, right? That's a whole other animal because it's yeah. 90 minutes of, of the character. Yeah. Not, not like a quick take of 18 seconds and then, okay, let's go again. Or even an audition where you just do, like, you have to be consistent. And you have and to memorize an entire, all that dialogue where you don't everything. normally like, every like, on oh, today I have to work, work on this bit stuff. But like now it's like, right. oh, you gotta do a whole 90 minute, whatever your half of that is, yeah. But that's exactly it. And I've yeah. never worked in that kind of frame before. And, and so I said I would do the play. And for me, it was leading to, um, th this is, I'm not working a lot now. This is gonna challenge me. So I wanna, I wanna do this. And then I got an offer, uh, like a 10 episode offer to do Alcatraz. So now right. I've got Alcatraz with network money, more money than I've ever made in the business to a play that I'm not going to be making any money, but is extremely challenging. Yeah. And, and I had to make the decision to go, you know, Hey guys, I can't do the play. You know, I'm going to do this thing cause it's 10 episodes, but I knew that that not only would that role not challenge me, but um, I, I, I was strictly going for the finances. I was strictly just, and that goes away quickly. Sure. This, ex this experience, and I was getting a little long in the tooth and old, old to do that role. And I don't think I would have an opportunity to do that role again. So I chose something that wasn't going to pay me, but was going to fill my soul. And when I did that and I got nominated for it, which was amazing. And I worked with wow. like Lori Triolo and Jason Good, who directed it. Like it, it, it was the best experience in my life. And then walking back, this is when the the moment comes in where I talked about walking into the bar and owning it. Now I've just done something I've never done before and other people responded so well with it. So every audition I went into, I owned it because I, I look, I just did a fucking massive play for the first time. I owned the audition. They may have never seen me in the play, but it's the way I'm walking in and it's the way I'm confident about the lines that I never had before. And if wow. I didn't put myself in that position, I would have had a ceiling. If I didn't yeah. do that play, there would have been a ceiling. And I took the ceiling away by, by going, like, I actually can do this job. So that, that kind of helped in that way. That's such a big lesson, man, because so many of us would be like, well, I can't say no to the money. I got mm -hmm. alimony or you know, whatever things that guys right. got going on. And, and people do. People build careers. People can, you, you could have built an entire career of being that guy. You know, the guy right. in, in the John Wick movie that fights him for a few minutes and gets killed. He's one of those guys. You know, it's like you right. could easily have been that guy. But I've seen you, you know, and that's what I think is the staying power of being able to kind of like when you reach into your bag of tricks, it's not a one trick pony. It's like it's a whole no. palette of different colors you can reach into. And I think that's really what's taking you into this whole other realm, realms of which we can't even talk about. Your, your career is right. so far reaching that there are secrets now. I love it. Yeah, but, I love it too. So when does, uh, like, I, I know we, we skip a bunch of things, but when you get into things like Van Helsing that become, I mean, what, 
what do you recognize for more when you're stopped in the street? Because I assume that thing has its own, you know, its own fan base, its own thing. And it's been going on for a long time. Um, yeah. And now Snowpiercer it takes it to a whole other level where I'm like, when I'm like, I used to see you, you know, when I, those first times I would see you with, whether it was Ed Asner or, or Roddy McDowell and be like, what? And now it's like, Jennifer Connelly, what, what's going on? Like, I just, like those, those weird moments where I'm seeing guys that I love, guys that I came up with, and I'm seeing them amongst people that, you know, that live in a sort of like mythical place in our brains when it comes to famous actors and stuff like that. Yeah. Like Slash. Well, sure. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Kids like that. That kid's got a future. Come on. <laughs> that kid. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But yeah, no, I get I, I get recognized for for Van Helsing all the time, and, sure. and right, lately lately it's been Snowpiercer too. Um, but it's uh, it's I, I love it. I love I love that feeling. I remember, and and this kind of was a subconscious thing. And then I was talking to somebody about it, and I was like, oh my god, this is where it started. I, 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 Serge Savard was a, a Montreal Canadiens hockey player. Sure, yeah, and he, yeah. And, and I loved him when I was, I was six years old and I was just loved him and he got traded to Winnipeg. And so I'm like, oh my God, Serge Savard's playing for Winnipeg. And I remember going to a game, being right beside uh, uh, the, where they walk in and out after the uh, pre-skate. And I ran there and he was doing his pre-skate and he was coming across and I'm like, I'm going to be able to chant, like see him this close. And as he walked off the ice, he looked at me and gave me a little wink. I remember that wink. Wow. It made me feel so fucking good. And, and now I get a, now I'm in a position to do that with other people, people sure. that watch the show and go home, like five seasons of Julius. And for some reason, you know, people gravitate to different characters and I'm his very favorite character. And I get a message that says, hey, you're probably never going to see this, but you're my favorite character in Van Helsing. And then I go, I saw it. Thanks a lot. I keep watching. And then they lose it, sending me a video. Go, oh my God, I can't. That's, that's the shit that I know what that feels like. It just empowers you. And it does. I didn't know that until later in life where I went, oh my God, that was, that's where it started. It started right at that moment. That's so cool because the, the reverse can happen too if you've had somebody be a dick to expert. you. Yeah, yeah. And that yeah. can that can make you go the other way too. It, it is a really fascinating thing because I'm constantly, I don't know about you, but I'm constantly baffled by anybody, you know, filling you with any kind of like praise like that. I'm always kind of like, oh, well, thank you. You know, it's like, the, you, mm -hmm. I think that might be some prairie stuff in there. I think just good upbringings to some degree. Like, I, I don't feel like, like when I was younger, I definitely, please tell me more about, I have value and I, and I right. could be something. Right. Like, Affirmations. Actually, yeah. You kind of like, cause you're like so desperate for someone to like, you know, playing terrible bars and things like that. When someone says, you've got talent, you go, please fill up yeah. this empty vat of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I but get it, I get as, it. As you get older, you become a little bit more like self-aware and you're, you're, you know who you are, you know what you do. And, um, and you appreciate when someone says, you do good work and I, and I think that you're great. Wow, well, thank you so much. That's, and it really does honestly mean the world to me. Um, but I, it's, re it's a really tough thing because some people, they need that like a drug and it becomes like, right. there's never enough of that. And, it, and, and you have to be careful with that because then you start surrounding yourself with nothing but people who tell you how wonderful you are, That's exactly which, I, which I know you and I do, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Surrounded by yes men. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it, it, what, what's interesting about that is, is I like, there was this moment of, I did a movie early in my career that I got, I was lucky to get, um, lucky to do because they cast another actor the other actor fell through they needed some somebody tomorrow sure. and i just happened to be in the right spot right and I, I and so it was my biggest role but but i treated it like a game i didn't really treat it seriously because i i was too insecure to know what what that meant at that time okay i just knew that this is this is fun and here we go i didn't do a backstory i didn't work on stuff i didn't try to understand the other characters i didn't do any of that i was just in and, and then after the movie was, was shown, somebody came up to me going, oh my God, you, you in that movie, unbelievable. And I was literally going, are you fucking with me right now? Are you, are you fucking with me? Are you, are you trying to start a fight? Are you being sarcastic? Like, I, that's how I thought. I thought he was like being wow. a prick. Right, right. And I didn't receive it well at all. Interesting. But like you said, once once you get older and you put in the work and you put in the work 
you know, on your own, especially, and you know who you are. Now, when somebody compliments me on, on my work, I, it, it lands and I listen to them and I hear them and I give them back of, you know, being grateful. Uh, I, I, I didn't know how to handle it earlier in my career. Even if somebody told me I was a good bass player, I was right. like, you don't know, ba you don't know bass playing then. So but whatever, <laughs> you know, like, but I think, uh, I think our opinion as the performer sometimes is the last opinion that matters. You know I mean? I've walked mm -hmm. off stage and been like, oh, that was horrendous. That cable went down, uh, right. the mic, the mic cut out, you know, it's all kinds of things. And the drummer forgot that part and you'll just be like hung up on it. And then someone will walk up to you and go, dude, that was awesome. You know, and it, and it isn't so much, they're not sitting there like with their scorecard going, oh, the drummer missed that part. You see that microphone? Right. They're just, they're having an right. experience to what you're doing. And it's the same with a, an acting performance, I assume. Uh, so when you say, oh, dude, that there was a light glaring in my eye, that entire scene, I couldn't really, whatever it is, you know what I mean? And that none of that matters because what really matters is the people who are watching or listening or paying attention what their experience is. And we kind of just end up being this conduit for their mm -hmm. experience. And it really, it really puts it in perspective. Like I've learned to be just kind of like to walk off stage and be like, you know, that was what it was. Like, it was like, right. It, Cause there's times where you feel like, like I've learned in, in different, in different performers as well. Like slash I'll walk off stage and go, dude, that crowd was amazing. And I, and he'll go like, I had a weird night. My guitar was this. And you go, Oh, it's a shame. He wasn't able to be in that moment. You know what I mean? Right. Um, right. It's just because it's different for everybody. And I think that I, I've gotten pretty good at being like, uh, I forgot some words in this song or I, I tripped over my right. own, whatever. And just go like, it's not about me anymore. It really, it's just right. about them, you know? And I, and I That's, would imagine I, acting's the same. Yeah. It's, it's parallel because you know, when I'm, I can, I can go like, Oh man, I should have, I should have could have did so much more work on that show. And, and then somebody coming up to me and going, I watched you in that episode and I thought it was phenomenal. I then rob them when I go, uh, thanks. I was sick as a dog that day, you know, like I, it wasn't my best. I robbed them of what they just gave me and what they experienced. So to sit back and truly enjoy somebody else enjoying a performance, I know that I can do better. That's my own thing. I don't have to share that with anyone and tell them, you know, th that ex their experience could have been different if I was more on point. And I, I, it's, I think it's so parallel of just being in the moment and, you know, there's there's times where I've completely forgot lines because I was in, in such in the scene so much, but just stay in the scene and not call for line and just finish it the way you would want to finish it because it's so raw and so now and you're in the moment and the scene's over. Technically, your brain goes, how the fuck did you forget all those lines? But the director will go, I don't care about the lines. What you did was exactly the scene. And right. that's what you have to give trust to and, and understand that, okay, great, moving on. You know? There's a certain, there's a certain part of that, that lends itself within like jazz or something. You know I mean? Like I, I imagine you've been on sets where it's pop. It's like, you need to know the words, you need to know the thing. It's going to be this, like it has a very structure. And then that other jazz aspect of watching films or acting in where it's like, this is the structure and there is a framework, but you're able to kind of stretch out. And like you said, Maybe you've lost, you know, the the train of thought that's supposed to create whatever the next line is, and you turn it into something else, and that makes something that would never have been there even better. You know what I mean? And I think that's that's mm -hmm. that's pretty bold on the on the director's part and the actor's parts, as far as I'm concerned. That sounds yeah, scary absolutely. As shit. Yeah, it is. But the best part of it is, you know, the excitement that you see, and I've experienced it a few times. Um, not just for myself, but for other people that I've worked with, the excitement that you see when something just goes off track a little bit, but it almost makes everything that much better in the scene. Right. And then when they yell cut, they're like, oh, did we get that? We got that? He can't do that again. Like that was just, we can't reproduce that. Right, right, right. Um, that, that, and everyone excited that they, yeah, yeah, we got it. Audio, audio, you good? Audio? They're like, yeah, we got it all. Oh my God. You know, like that excitement is so much different than um, when you absolutely nail the lines, like in the pop aspect of it. Um, but it's invigorating and, and literally, like you said, a conduit and just got to let the moments flow. And we're, 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 in such, we're in such a position in, in what we do to 
to share what we get to share and influence other people. Like that's a pretty, that's a pretty great thing. It is. I don't think that, you know, I, I think that's what's intoxicating about spending time with you is, is, is your passion is so, uh, you know, addicting and it's so like inspiring because, you know, like, like you've been in the industry a long time. I've been in the industry a long time. There's plenty of guys that we know who are in it, who are like the old gunslingers that are kind of like, all right, time to go. <laughs> they just got to get up and they do their thing and they're, and they're great at it. But they don't yeah. have that kind of like, isn't this great? Like, you know, where I right. was like, when I was a kid and like, I still have the same energy now when it's like the truck broke down or the, you know, the, the whatever's not working, a bunch of things. And I'm still going like, it's a magic factory, isn't it? We're just like, <laughs> <laughs> we're making dreams here, you know? And other guys are just like, you know, going to go, go back to a day job and just leave. And I'm like, I'm still here because I just still get a kick out of it. And that's what I get from you is, 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 is that, I mean, the reality of what you do is that the fun part for you is, is, you know, being a musician or whatever, it's like, I'm who I am. The cool thing about being an actor is it's like, you get to be so many different people in the course of a year or in the course of your life that you're kind of like, like you say, you get to play the big strong guy, you get to play the vulnerable person, you get to play people who aren't anything like who you actually are, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's really a very exciting, it's an exercise that most of us just don't get to do. I, and I, I totally agree. And, and I love being able to create something along with the, the team of makeup artists or costumes and director. And that, a part of that journey is so amazing to me. But I, I feel like stuff like this, like you and I talking or, you know, I, I did a few interviews yesterday beca uh, because of uh, Snowpiercer and Van Helsing coming out. So I've been doing a ton but of they, press. They, were, they weren't even close to as fun as this. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't. They, dude, they weren't. You know they weren't. Uh, this is why I love you. You're such a good actor. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's on the side going, wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, no, but this is the shit, you know, this yeah. is years of, the, yeah, but but I love, I love doing that stuff and I love, sharing it in a way where people who are fans of the show will listen to the podcast and they're like they know a little bit more about me those that i really love doing press and press to me is um is another vessel for me to kind of be creative and share whatever i can share and then get whatever back but the the, the key is you're right i i absolutely love this job and there's a lot there's a few jobs that i've had where i went this is so not what i expected and maybe the people that I've been working with on this, like I'm, when you when you go on to a show that you're really not on, right? Uh, you're basically first, you're you're like the new kid in school, and yeah. you'll either get some bullies or you'll get people really welcoming. And I've experienced people that were just extremely disrespectful because I was just I'm I, I, I'm on for an episode and I'm gone, and not I, for me with Van Helsing. Anybody that was in the makeup trailer that was new, I was all over of just like, thank you so much for being a part of the show. They're just going to do a way better job knowing that we're there to support them as opposed to somebody coming in to fix the plumbing and you just like, yeah, just, okay, whatever. And yeah, then you, you leave. And but, but you would never be that way to the guy doing the plumbing. I mean, it's like, to me, no. it's like, you know, it's just, it's just, it's wrong. And I think that it's like, it's so fucking lame when people kind of, you give anybody just the tiniest piece of authority or, or, you know, caste system kind of in place and they just abuse it and i'm always like dude come on you know it's like yeah. we, we're all doing this we all love it we're all lucky to be here because it's you know we you never know that's the interesting thing about what we do i've been doing this long enough in this industry that if this was a, if this was an office i had started in at 17 15 years old i'd be the president of this company but that's not the way right. this, that's not the way this works it's you keep doing the work you're hopefully doing good work crazy there's ups and there's downs and there's ups and there's downs and and it's just bound to happen. And it's bound to happen for the next, as long as I continue to do this. And the interesting thing about entertainment and showbiz is that you really aren't, you know, you, all you can do is just ride that wave and do your, and surf as best as you know how, you know, because you're going to fall and you're going to have to get back on that board. And you're going to, like you say, and some of your falls that you think are some of your worst falls are going to be the ones that people come up and go, dude, when you fell in that movie, that was, you know, you know, that kind right. of, and you're like, oh, well, thank you, you know, and you don't know. So you just kind of keep going. And then hopefully you're at like 85 years old, you look back and go, that was, that was a hell of a ride, man. That was, that was, you know, that was that, a hell of a ride. And we both, we, we you know, we, because we know a lot of the same people for the last you know 30 years we've lost some people that are really close to us absolutely important um, people you know yeah. that have passed they're very important people and, and which makes you be that much more grateful to be able to wake up every morning and get to do this life 
You know what Absolutely. I mean? Because, you know, for, for me, we both agree that Scully was one of the most creative people we have ever met. Absolutely. And I, for him to be doing what he was doing until the time he passed was glorious to me. Knowing that he left, left this place in, a, in, a, in, in the millisecond of doing what he loved doing gives me a little bit of peace in the heart. And that's why every day I want to wake up loving everything that I'm doing. So I, I don't know when that clock's going to hit midnight, you know? So what we're doing right now, I think, is one of those things where we're really taking advantage of our lives and, and having a fucking hell of a ride through the ups and downs. Absolutely. Understanding that it's always going to be like that. You can't mm -hmm. just put on a happy face when something terrible is happening, yeah. but you can, you can really own it in a way of understanding the, the ride and the journey. And I so, think yeah. that that makes for, you know, it makes you appreciate when things are good, you know, and, and that when things kind of start getting rough, you kind of know, okay, we're in a rough patch, but right. I've been through this a number of times. It'll come around, you know, and that's right. That's kind of the beauty of it. And like you say, with guys like Scully, who, you know, were so beyond creative that there was no, he just was, it just was a ball of energy that was just going to always be this big beaming light. And it could never be dimmed other than, to just finally leave this realm entirely. But right. I think that, you know, like you say, to leave, you know, doing exactly what you wanted to do and exactly what you're put here to do. Hey, that's, that's, that's the gold medal of life, isn't it? You know, I mean, that's kind of what that is. We should all be so has, lucky. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with finances, man. It no. has nothing to do with getting paid. It's like, you're doing what you love to do every exactly. day. Absolutely. And it's just a cherry on top that you get paid for it once in a while, you know, that's exactly true. So, 2021 the, the cool thing about doing what you do you can actually work so you're working you're in atlanta we can say that i can say that yeah i'm yeah. not gonna say yeah. what you're working on but it's such a that's the other cool yeah. thing about your gig is it's like you know uh, you know is you you get to go and like put down roots in weird places and in and, and, yeah and, and see interesting places and new faces and and have these experiences it's a it's a wonderful thing i'm very excited about it and you know we started just before we started in November and we started shooting in New York. And then now we're fit finishing up here in Atlanta for the next few months. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate. I can't really, I get busting at the scenes to talk about it, but I, I, I am just over the moon to be a part of a project like this. And, and knowing that, you know, during this stressful time of COVID where not, not a lot of people are, are working, I'm extremely grateful and, and um, doing the best that I can to stay healthy and, we're getting we're getting tested. Uh, I I don't want to be the dude that shuts down production. No, you know not I mean? at all. No, no, no. And no. and so I really I really I'm taking this this seriously and making sure you know I'm not that dude and working really really hard. I'm super grateful that I'm in this position. Well, that's what part two is going to be about. When we can finally talk about things you can't talk about, I'm going to be like deal. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I I really I've I've kept you more than, longer than I should have. So, but I love you. And I'm so proud of you. And I look forward to. <laughs> you just passed this audition. I just, I just did. I just did Todd Kearns' show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it's the theme, song. That's theme song. That's the theme song right it's there. Right? It's been missing. It's, it's a damn it hit. <laughs> damn it. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Anytime. Well, when you, uh, I'll, I'll, it's like, I was going to say, I'll reach out at some point, but we, we keep in touch basically through social media all the time. So it's, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you get back to work and do something productive with the, with your day. But, uh, I am so, you know me well enough to know how excited I am for all the things you have coming up. So I'm, I, I, I thank, thank you, man. I am on fire. So keep in touch, big love, take care of yourself, stay healthy. We'll see you soon. Love you, brother. Love you.